Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. We are ready to get back in our Father's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <clears throat> this is a chapter that's extremely important. If you're minus what is included within this chapter, I'm sorry, you don't make the cut. So that's how important it is. You either have this element, uh, this gift, or you're out of business. You can have all the gifts God sends, that's chariz, a charisma of uh, prophecy, of teaching, of healing. If you don't have this one, none of it works. Okay. So you want to pay close attention to make sure you have it. Chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, that's to say love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, just little old things blowing in the wind, conveying no message and worthless other than a little tinkling sound. So you want to be more than a little tinkling sound. You want to convey a message and it wants to be the traditions of the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, what is this tongues of men and angels? It's glacia. You, you, um, though you can maybe be bilingual even. And um, the angels know what, because they know all languages. But man doesn't, of course. Verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, even the mystery of God, and all knowledge loaded with it. And though I have all faith, and faith is what really opens those doors to heaven, okay, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. So you, you want to be something and you want to be able to make a stand. And it is love that grants you patience. And many people don't understand love. Love has a part that is called tough love. And when you see somebody going really wrong and you know they need advice, if they are um, a friend of yours, a loved one, you love them enough to correct them. And though they may not appreciate it at the time, but you know they're headed for trouble. You're not judging, it's obvious and with tough love, you exercise it. If you do not have tough love, as long as the, uh, uh, with love, which brings patience and understanding, you're pretty well out of business. You're too business-like. Christians must forgive. Christians must have forgiveness in their heart. And so it is. Uh, and, and hey, that is to say, uh, you forgive, you don't have to forget. And so it is. Uh, in love, you don't have to love those that dislike you. That's not necessary. But at the same time, you can set yourself apart from them, and that in itself is tough love. It works real good. Okay. You must have love, charity. That it is the mechanism on which all the gifts travel. It's directly from our Heavenly Father because He loves us. And Christ loved you enough that He died on the cross that you could have those gifts, that charisma, to exercise it. Verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, cremated, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. It's, it's, it's no good without love. You know, the quicker you can absorb this and understand it, love brings patience and understanding, and 
charity is such a wonderful thing. It is the trademark, trademark of Christianity because with it comes compassion. And as far as God's elect are concerned, you show me somebody that has no compassion and I'll show you somebody that is not one of God's elect. That's one of the easiest ways to spot one of the Zadok, one of God's elect. They will always have compassion. Though they may have faults, they will have compassion. Verse 4, <clears throat> charity suffereth long. All kinds of patience and is kind. Charity envieth not. It, it doesn't envy somebody, which means jealousy. It's not jealous at all. Charity vaunteth um, not itself. It, it doesn't um, pretend or put on airs or pretend it's something it's not. It's not puffed up. It's not just all full of hot air. It's the real thing. Charity is love, and it's obvious. It comes forth. And charity can, at the same time, tough love is a beautiful thing. When someone needs correction, you establish the fact. <clears throat> and let love be long-suffering, not puffed up, and certainly no jealous, no room for jealousy. Verse 5, uh, uh, that is to say, unless there's a reason to be. Verse 5 reads, doth not behave itself unseemly. It's never rude. Okay. Seeketh not her own. Uh, that's her, her own rights. Necessarily, she'll even give way a little bit with compassion and make room for the weak and the un, those unlearned, is not easily provoked. It doesn't, it doesn't soon anger. Uh, thinketh no evil. It, in other words, plans, charity causes one to always plan uh, and prosper in the positive and certainly not the negative. Uh, this is a trait that you must have. If you're going to be in the many-membered body of Christ, as Christ so walked, so must you. As best you can, we're not going to walk like he was perfect. But at least um, you follow these examples. And, and I'll say it again as from verse 1. You can have prophecy. You can have healing. You can have interpreting tongues. You can have a lot of things. But if it's not based on the foundation of love, which is to say Christ, in Christ's love, you're nothing. You're not going anywhere. People will avoid you in certain places even. And how can you spread God's word if people avoid you? You've got to have charity. It's necessary. Verse 6, next verse please. And it reads, Rejoiceth not in iniquity. It does not give any joy in sin and in injustice to anyone, but rejoiceth in the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is God's word. God's word is love. He sent this love letter to you for you to understand and be able to absorb the simplicity in which he teaches that a child can understand. Love is a beautiful thing. It's very difficult for some people to understand. Where does it come from? Well, it's it's... It's in your system. It is Christianity at its best because at the base of a true Christian, and that is this factor here, the truth has the word of God, pretty lives it to the best of their ability, and that in itself says a lot of words. When you see somebody that lives the way, you don't, they don't have to say anything. People can tell by looking that there's a man or a woman or a child of God. And, and so it is that um, truth, which is the Word of God, when you absorb it, you absorb what? Knowledge, wisdom, gifts from God. That's uh, the gift, the word gift in the Greek is chariz, and chariza is charisma. It grows upon you, and you have that charisma, and it comes forth in charity, that is to say, love. Love and truth walk hand in hand, and it's very necessary. Verse 7, bearing all things, believing all things, hoping all things, 
endureth all things, no provocation, able to handle it, can do type person, can cut it. You know, uh, many people will push at Christianity. Many people try to take the name of God out of our vo very vocabulary. And um, what do we do about it? We, we, don't, we, uh, we don't get angry, we get even. Okay. There's ways to get even with love and charity and understanding. You have some people that are so ignorant and so tinged with communistic characteristics that love goes out the window and they're worthless. And so it is uh, that um, uh, we'll get even. Don't worry about it. Well, where is love in that? Love to protect those that love the Lord Jesus Christ, that love his name. And those that would tromp upon it are our enemy, and we treat them as such. Verse 8, charity, that's love, never faileth. It's always there. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Man's not perfect, okay? Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. And whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, um, and naturally, uh, you, you will notice where it says tongues here, the word unknown is not there. Okay. But this word is glossier, and it means a language, though you have a language you weren't born with. And when, when you have a language you weren't born with, you are bilingual. And when you are bilingual, even still, you need to interpret. You might say, well, now wait, if, if a person is bilingual, for instance, if they know English and Spanish, why would they need an interpreter in, in a Spanish-speaking people? Well, it's quite simple because you will always think in the language you were born with. And you will think in that language, and in your own mind, you will translate it to the language you were not born with. So translation is a very important thing even when you're bilingual. But the word unknown is not connected with this because it just simply means a language that's different. Why, well, why is this? Because of God's love, he wanted every language, every ethnic group to be able to hear and know the word of God, the truth. How can they understand the truth if they do not understand the language? And that's why Paul would say, I speak more languages than all of you. He spoke Hebrew, he spoke Greek, he spoke Aramaic, he spoke Latin from Rome uh, because his father was a, a Roman citizen and uh, he, he spoke many languages. But he said, I would rather speak five words that are understood than a whole list of words and names, okay? So, and so it is. But there comes a time, especially when we meet that seventh trump, that things change, okay? Verse 9, and we know in part, when we're in these flesh bodies, we know in part, and we prophesy in part, you, meaning you don't know everything, and you work at it, you pray about it, you have that love as a foundation, and that's wonderful, verse 10. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. In other words, um, it supersedes. When we hear that seventh trump, when we're translated into uh, spiritual bodies, we have total recall. We remember as it was, and certainly you don't see in part because you're looking behind the veil. You know the truth. You can see it. When, when you're in that spiritual body, there are questions you would have now that will seem so simple whenever you're in the spiritual body. Why couldn't we have understood that? at that time, and, and, and so it is. That's the way it always supersedes. We've got a, some real good things to look forward to in the Lord, in the truth, and in love. Verse 11, when I was a child, when I was immature, I spake as a child. I, I, I was a little immature in the way I would present things. 
I understood as a child. I, I really was just a beginner, okay? I thought as a child. That's, that's, that was my vocabulary. That's the way it was. But when I became a man, I, when I, there, this is not, there's no gender in this, both man and woman, I put away childish things. And, and that's what you do. And how do you do that? You take on love. You take on charity. You develop patience. And as you become uh, more proficient in understanding our Father's truth, it makes the love a lot easier because you have that understanding of maturity and, and um, common sense that is entailed right in the Father's Word. Verse 12. And now we see through a glass darkly. It's kind of like looking through a dark glass. You can't quite make things out plainly like you would like to. But then face to face, I mean the glass is removed in that spiritual body, in that dimension, we see everything. Now I know in part, Paul says, I, I can kind of see in part, I know which way it's going, but then shall I know even as also I am known. As God knows me, so will I know uh, the real truth and the total picture. Verse 13 to complete the chapter, to complete chapter 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. It's the greatest of all the gifts. You might say, well, is it the easiest? Well, if you do not have compassion, it's not that easy. But at the same time, you can't force love. You have to earn it. You have to gain that love within yourself in knowledge and wisdom and understanding to be able to know and comprehend that we do see in part. That does not discourage us. We keep working to see clearly for we know that as time moves, God gives us truth from his traditions, his way. We know his way is perfect and we know that perfect love is from our Father for he loves each of us. He may not love what a lot of people do, but he created everything for his pleasure. <clears throat> and quite frankly, in the eternity, that that does not pleasure him, it won't be here. It'll be gone. So with all the gifts, and there are great gifts, chariz, if, if you do not have those gifts if you or you're part of them as God gives to you, he doesn't necessarily give everybody all of them, but most important, the gift you do have, the chariz, let love, charity, be the bed for it, and then you will be successful in ministering, that is bringing forth the truth, the letter of the living God. Chapter 14, verse 1. Follow after charity. You follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. This is to teach in the sense of teaching. Best of all is in your gifts, careers, hope that you can teach. Why? Because it spreads the truth. It enables people. It gives them hope. It gives them a destiny in our Father's Word, a purpose. And when it's done in love, it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now, again, I, I want you as a student of God's Word to note that the word unknown is in italics, meaning what? It's not in the manuscripts. Well, why isn't the word unknown in the manuscripts? Because of the word tongue, glossia. It means a tongue that you are not born with. And, um, and the gift, uh, if, if, you, if you cannot... If you want to prophesy and teach, 
And you cannot communicate with the people that speak that tongue. You're out of business. You may have the most perfect gift there is. But if you can't communicate with them, you're in a heap of hurt. And, and many might say, well, I, I can't quite understand that. Well, let's see, let's see. What if I were to say to you, Ojo san koko kinese. Did you understand that? I know some of you do, but the majority will not. Or if I were to say, Ichi ni san chi go riko hichi haichi koju. That's a language. And then, on the other hand, I could say, Hana tulsi de watasa iyugo yodo aho empe. Now, uh, many would say, what, what, is, what is he saying? Well, if you can't understand the language, then you wouldn't know. Now, if I say, Ojo san koko kinese doso, that's Japanese. And it says, young man, would you come over here, please? And then a very thing that a child can do, the second portions, one in Japanese and one in Korean, is something a child can do. It was count from one to ten. Okay. It's that simple. But yet at the same time, if you don't understand the language, you don't know that. And that's why God is saying here and explaining you, you want to, um, with a, though you speak with an unknown tongue, not unto men, but unto God, you got to speak the language they speak, or they do not understand what you're talking about. That's what God is saying. Verse 3, But he that prophesieth, that is to say teacheth, speaketh unto men to edification. It's to improve, to bring them the word of God, to raise them up in love and charity and comfort. It's such a comfort when they can understand what you're saying. Verse 4, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, again I call your attention, the word unknown is in italics, meaning it's not in the manuscripts, but tongue here is a language you were not born with, edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. In other words, <clears throat> when one, even if you are bilingual, you still have to, you're going to think in your native language and you're going to interpret it into another tongue or you're going to not be bilingual and you're going to have an interpreter with you that will explain in that language what it is you're saying and an interpreter will carry the same force, the same meaning, in that language that you teach in for emphasis in the English language or whatever language you might have. And without any of it, if you don't have charity, you got nothing, okay? But with charity, you work things out. You reach those people. If you can't learn their language, then you find you an interpreter where you can take that truth to them. Verse 5. I sh would that you all spake with tongues. I wish all of you were bilingual and knew as many languages as I do. Paul had a bunch of them. But rather that you prophesied, that you're a teacher. For greater is he that prophesieth, that teaches, than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret. He must do the interpreting himself again. That, that's a little difficult, but if you ever learn another language, you know that you think in your native tongue and then in your own mind translate that to the, to the foreign language in, uh, that you were not born with, that the church may receive edifying. In other words, you cannot help the church if you cannot communicate. If they do not know what... In other words, I, I, could go, I could go in Spanish or I could go in Japanese or I could go in the Korean tongues for the rest of this, this uh, lecture. It would be meaningless because we would not have an interpreter. And, uh, and, and secondly, I'm not that fluent in all those languages that I could do justice to the Word of God without an interpreter. Verse 6, Now, brethren, if I come unto you Speaking with tongues, glacia, what shall I profit you? 
except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Hopefully, even though I can speak to you in your language, I hope that I have a message, that it is a revelation, that it is from God. In other words, that it is truth and it is God's word. Seven, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? In other words, if it's just a bunch of notes and there's no harmony, there's no tune, it means nothing. It's just a bunch of noise. In other words, you could play one of your favorite songs and then take that same instrument and put it in the hands of somebody that can't play it or otherwise, and all you got is a bunch of gibberish. And God is not the author of confusion. Our Father is the author of peace. So charity, that is to say love, and the ability to communicate, that is to find a way to communicate to those people. Either learn the language yourself and interpret from your native tongue to that language or take an interpreter that well understands bilingual your language and that language and can justify interpreting, which is not simply to interpret the language, but to interpret it with emphasis okay, so that God's word carries through. Then it's not some thing twinkling or whistling Dixie. Well, it wouldn't be whistling Dixie. We could understand that, couldn't we? But just sound. It means nothing. Okay. Verse 8. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? In other words, if, if, um, if I have a trumpet blow taps, most of you know what taps mean. Okay. It's a salute. It is played in, in saluting at funerals and many other places, uh, our great flag in this nation. Or if you were to sound reveille, that is a very distinct sound in the military, all of its own. It means get up, wake up. It's get up time. That's what the trumpet says. Or if the trumpet blows charge, then in the military, you know what to do. You know that that sound means charge. It communicates a message. If you cannot in love communicate a message, which is the truth, the word of God, to a group of people, you need to do a little reorganizing. And through the advice you have received so far in this chapter, by either arranging yourself bilingual or taking an interpreter with you that is bilingual, who can interpret with emphasis the very word of God. That is to say, when the sound comes, it will have meaning, distinctly bringing forth in volume and in truth, the very word of God, not just somebody blowing in the dark, okay? Verse nine, so likewise, we accept, so likewise ye accept ye utter by the tongue, glossia words, easy to be understood, if you can't speak their language, how shall it be known what is spoken? They won't understand. For you have, you shall speak into the air. Konnichiwa, konnichiwa, konnichiwa. You see, a different language it means nothing to most people. How precious is the word of God when you can communicate the love of God and the truth whereby it edifies, it builds up the body of Christ, and it fortifies one into the ability to withstand the enemy, knowing when that trumpet changes, and even in the book of Revelation, that you understand what each trump signifies, though you don't hear the trump, you know by the very action itself it interprets to you that trump has sounded. Whether you hear it or not, you know from the word what's going down. It communicates. Verse 10, there are, 
it may be so many kinds of voices, tongues, unknown to you, in the world, and none of them is without signification. It, they all mean something. You need to reach those people. It's, um, and, and if you understand those languages, they mean something. There is a meaning there. And naturally, the only way that you can reach those people, again, I suppose we're having a little repetition here, but it's difficult for some people. I, I, I want to break in to say at the same time, this is not talking about the tongue on Pentecost Day. For if, if you read about the tongue on Pentecost Day, the un word unknown is not there. And it doesn't happen until the Antichrist appears on this earth and God's elect are delivered up before him and they're not to premeditate what they will say. And this was an example as spoken of by Joel the prophet when the sons and the daughters are delivered up before the Antichrist. Acts chapter 2, verse 6. Now when th this was noised, the cloven tongue, abroad the multitude came together and were confounded. They were astonished. Why were they astonished? Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Because it wasn't the people speaking, it was the Holy Spirit speaking through them, and it was every language of the world. You will not find the Pentecostal tongue anywhere unknown. Just the opposite. Everybody knew it. It wasn't a bunch of yabby dee dabby dee doo. It was the truth from God's word on mouth, uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, heard it in their own language, seven, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in his own tongue wherein we were born? They're, they're even speaking in the dialect of the county I was born in. And, but yet they were from Galilee. Shouldn't have known my language. But it was the Holy Spirit speaking. So do not confuse this tongue we're speaking of here with the tongue of Pentecost that God's elect will speak when the false Messiah is on this earth. We'll pick this up in the next lecture. Fascinating charity. Hang on to it. Cherish it. It's love. And when you love our Lord, he let, returns that love and blesses you. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldea, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. We have a judge, it's our Father, and uh, we do have the right, a gift of spiritual discernment. You do. It's a gift from God that lets you know when you hear truth, you will recognize it. And when you hear something you really can't go along with, you'll put it to the side. And, and uh, God will do the judging otherwise. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, I got a prayer, re prayer request. You don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. You're his child, and he loves you. May not love what you're doing, but he does love you. 
return that love to him and be blessed. He will love you all the more. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Let charity come into this world. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, and question time. And we're going to go with um, Patty from California. Um, I understand that our souls return to our Heavenly Father as soon as the silver cord is broken. I don't understand why we have so many hauntings of souls that don't go to heaven. Why are they trapped here on earth? Uh, please help. Also, is, is it dangerous? Um, you know, many times people... Uh, there are really no such thing as ghosts in a way. They're spirits. Evil spirits, Christ's spirit is a good spirit. Okay. And, and many times, um, he will, even in the transition of death, he will send a loved one, their spirit, spiritual body, to convey and usher someone on through. And, and that's good. But there are also many times that evil spirits tempt people, uh, like, uh, like Saul when he prayed for uh, the um, witch of Endor to call up an evil spirit, okay? The spirit of, of, of you, you're all familiar with it, but there are, they're not behind every bush, but don't ever be shocked because there are evil spirits in this world. And for every negative, there is a positive. God allows the Holy Spirit to, to visit us, to be with us. But he also allows Satan and his evil ones, their spirits, to come to this earth. But you see, the beauty of it is he gave us power over all of them in Christ's name. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay, I hope that helps you. Francis from Michigan, I would like to know if when we are transformed into spiritual creatures during the millennium, will we still, will we still till the soil and eat the fruit of our labor? Uh, angels' food is manna, okay, and it's not food that we partake of today. So we will probably form it or come by it in a different way. How, I have no idea, but it will be wonderful. It's, it, it seems to be heavenly when they partook of it. Mana, that is to say. Uh, Jen from Indiana, please explain what Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 means. My Bible has footnotes that say the verse is evidence uh, of the rapture. Your Bible is wrong. There is no article whatsoever in 2 Thessalonians chapter 7 for the church. None whatsoever or rapture. People can show their ignorance sometimes. Not, I'm not talking down to you, but it's a very simple thing. Only he who letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. I'm quoting that seventh verse from 2 Thessalonians. There's no verb there. So it is what is known as a transitive verb. Meaning what? Meaning he who letteth, you must, until he's taken out of the way, you must transfer back to the prior verb in Greek to know and understand who it's talking about. So all you have to do is go back to verse 4, 5, and 6. Who's it talking about? The son of perdition standing in the holy place claiming to be God. And he, well, why is he, where is he going to be taken out of the way? Revelation chapter 12, 6, and 7. Michael and his angels cast down Satan and his angels. They are taken out of the way and cast to earth, and they will be right here among us joy to the world, okay? That's really, in Revelation, is woe to the world. Those are the three woe trumps as when they come. So you with companion Bibles, you're blessed because your parallel column makes it very simple and teaches you the Greek transitive verb and how it operates. Um, and it's very simple, giving you the scripture and so forth. 
when when some would be man's work in a side column says this represents this that and the other and there's no article they're not even in the subject are you going to believe the man or are you going to believe god okay that's that's what it melts down to you want to be very careful in in certain works that their commentary is not by christian scholars into the depth of the languages or you will get in trouble. You will have a difficult time understanding. Uh, Irma from Arkansas, where in the Bible does it say, if you don't work, you don't eat? That's um, in second, same book we just were talking about, only it's in the third chapter. Second Thessalonians chapter three is verse 10. But go back to verse six where it says, if a brother is disorderly, you can't get along with him, he's no good, set yourself apart from him. Don't do this, don't, don't treat him as an enemy, but treat him as a brother and, and edify him. That means practice a little tough love, but most of all, don't feed them. Don't be an enabler. All you do is push them further into the tank when you do that. And where does it say people take people who come to your house and you don't know and they want to stay with you? Other people tell me that it could be the Lord or it could be um, and not, or an angel and not to turn them away. Let me tell you something. In this generation, if the Lord intends to visit your home, he'll give you a, a foreknowledge of it. Okay. It is not wise at all. If a stranger comes to your house and wants to move in, you do not do that. There are too many that are enemy in this world. Uh, and quite frankly, you would be very dumb to allow a total stranger into your home for no reason whatsoever. It is one thing to be kind and to give direction if that is necessary. But uh, I know many religions use this to have their little traveling ministers uh, load up and, and uh, rather than earn, be uh, little freeloaders. Um, but they're not from God if they freeload. Okay? They're just not. They have to earn it. And God will always give you the unction and the foreknowledge if he sends somebody, so don't worry about it. He's got your phone number and he's got your mind. He can convey messages to you. But nobody should allow a total stranger that just knocks on the door into their home to, to uh, lodge. That's, that's not wise in this generation. Cheryl from Florida, what is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is to be deceived as to who the Antichrist is. Revelation chapter 13. The mark of the beast is... Uh, is for someone to not teach their congregation that the false Christ comes first, as Revelation 13 declares. Because if they do not teach their congregation that the false Christ comes first, their danger in danger of worshiping the false Christ is the true. Because he is, he is very deceptive, performs miracles in the sight of men as much as snapping his fingers and lightning coming down from heaven. A person that isn't forewarned about that, that would be very impressive. And they would think it was God's son in person. He's an imposter, as, as uh, Revelation 13 declares. The mark of the beast is to not teach the truth about the coming of the false Christ so you can fulfill God's wishes in Mark 13 to stand against him. Not premeditating what you will say, but allowing the Holy Spirit to do it through you. Donnie from Alabama. My son wants to know what it means, one taken from the field. Well, t take the whole chapter. What's the subject? Your subject and your article. Always, that's wisdom to know what you're talking about. Then you know who's taken from the field. It's the same subject I was just talking about. It is telling you in Matthew 24 as well as other chapters, Luke 21 and others, that the false Christ comes first. The field is the world, and you're supposed to be Christ workers. 
The first one taken from the field is taken by Antichrist. God expects his elect to stay in the field working, teaching the truth, and allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through them. So the first one to go is taken by Antichrist and is in bad, bad shape. Okay? Um, it's just common sense. All you've got to do is read it. Don't listen to what people say, this man or any other man. Let Matthew 24 flow for you. And it tells you who the first one is taken by, the Antichrist. It says, Lo, they will tell you he's in the field or he's somewhere else. Don't you believe it and don't you go. You stay in the field working. Uh, Mary from Ohio. However, my question is, where can I find in the Bible where it says, I don't teach my children to fly away? It, you, you'll find it in Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 18 through 24. It's, a, a lot of people ask this question. In your standard King James. Now, your NIV, the little Kenites have changed it. Okay, It, it just, instead of saying, They've sewn kerchiefs that cover every knuckle and joint of my outreached arms, God says, of salvation with their stories of teaching people to fly to save their souls, and I'm against it, he says. Now, the NIV, somebody went to work, and it says they teach birds to fly. Yeah. What, what has that got to do with the daughters of Jerusalem, that's to say of Israel, sewing uh, God's coverings over God's outreach saving arms, the truth, and hiding it with a lie. Okay? Doesn't have anything to do with it. It's deception by Satan trying to change the Word of God. Um, Wanda from Oklahoma. I have a question. I was told there are no female angels, only male angels. I thought there were non gender specific. If, um, uh, well, for, for when? Naturally, from the first earth age and this earth age, God created man in his own image, he and the angels. But then in, in the eternal spiritual body, as Jesus himself would say, you do not give nor are you taken in marriage, for they are as the angels in the third earth age, there is no gender. So it's according to what age you're talking about, okay? Faye from South Carolina. Question, how many of the denominations of the Christian faith are using false teaching? And then you're going into some church names. I don't judge churches, and I, I'm going to uh, forfeit back to what I was saying about the mark of the beast. A church that doesn't teach the false Christ comes first is, is hurting a heap. Let me, let me tell you how you can prove this. In, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you have seven churches. There are only two of those churches that teach a message that Christ is pleased with, that is acceptable. And you had better be in a church that's teaching what Smyrna and Philadelphia teach. And it simply is to let you know who the Kenites are and the fact that the false one comes first and that you are not to bow to him or worship him. That you have the key of David, it unlocks doors that no one can close on you and opens doors, that, again, that no one can close. But you have the truth. You have the word of God. So if you're not teaching, if your church that you attend is not teaching what Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2 and Philadelphia, Revelation chapter 3 teach out of the seven, you're in a heap of hurt. You're not being told the truth, the, the, I should say the completeness of truth and uh, as nearly as possible. So you, you need to check it out. Well, do, how, do I go by a church by that name? No, content, what is taught there. Okay, that's what's important. They tell you who the Kenites are, sons of Cain. Margaret from Kentucky. Would it be wrong if, if I ordered Satan and all his evil spirits out of my older sister's life and back where they... Absolutely. There's, you, uh, I want you to turn to Luke chapter um, 10 and verses uh, 19 
uh, forward, 18, 19, God gives you power over all your enemies. You can do it in proxy. You don't even have to tell her, okay? You, you have that ability. Will he do it? Find out. Uh, Cecil from Louisiana. I want to know if we can uh, take bread from the store to take Holy Passover. If not, please let me know. Well, it, it's, it's okay to take the bread in the cup, okay? It should be unleavened bread. You can, if you notice real closely, you can buy crackers that are unleavened. In other words, they do not have leaven in them, and they're, they're, they're pretty good crackers. And you can take that, and if you, have, if you do not have an illness against wine, you are supposed to use uh, pure wine, that is to say grape wine. Um, and because, why? Grape wine, when it ferments, all the garbage and trash is thrown off in a natural sense. It's pure. And that's symbolic of Christ's blood. It was pure. So um, it, it is fine to have those ingredients to take, okay? Alan from Washington, you have talked about the second book of Esdras being supposed by the, supported by the Masera. Does this include all 16 chapters, just three through 14? In part, okay? Which means it's, it's okay to go there and if you're a good student, you know when something comes that is foreign and you understand. Good speed is the very best of apocryphas. That's why we carry it in our uh, library. David from Oregon. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, who said where Satan's seat is? I don't know. I don't know Said that. who said that. Can you help me to understand what it means? Well, it's, it's real. We, we just covered it, really. You know where Satan's seat is? And Anthropos, which means against the Father, will play a very active part in that. But you can find Satan's seat in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Satan, the son of perdition, there's only one. There's only one son that's already been condemned to die by name. That happened in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. Satan's going to be turned to ashes, ashes from within. That's why he is called also son of perdition, meaning the son that perishes. Now, he sits in Jerusalem on Mount Zion claiming to be God, claiming to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, many people that you know calling themselves Christians are going to go with him thinking he is the Messiah. Why? They haven't been taught. Steve from West Virginia. Will Pastor Murray be a teacher in the millennium like he is here in the flesh? It is written in Revelation chapter 20 that God's elect, verse 5, that God's elect will be priest for a thousand years. So not just all of us all of us, you included, um, priests teach, okay? When we're in spiritual bodies, you have full recall. No, no step for a stepper, okay? Judy from Arkansas, where can I find in the Bible that we can help others on the wrong side of the gulf? If they are family members, Ezekiel chapter 44 is during the millennium, the Lord's Day thousand year period. It starts in chapter 40, but you will find what you're looking for in chapter 44, verses 20 through about 22 or 3, 4, somewhere along in there. That you can, if, if you are one of God's zadok, elect, that's the just, then you can help a mother, brother, sister unmarried, and father, and so forth. That means you will know them, and you can help them you, can't, you cannot uh, bring salvation to them. All you can do is practice a little tough love and say, you better get your stuff together. We're going to throw a lot of people in the lake of fire. And if you don't change and get your act together, that's where you're going, period. Okay? So it, it will be discipline that will be taught there. Rachel from Rochelle, rather, from Massachusetts. 
I have two handicapped children. Neither have good verbal skills. We go to church, and I'm raising them with Christian morals. My concern is I'm not sure how much they really absorb, and when the Antichrist comes, how am I to be sure they will know the difference? God always, you know, God loves his children. This is why Christ would say, do not prevent the children from coming to me. Okay. When, when people are handicapped, they're innocent. So don't, don't you, you're doing a fantastic job. Okay. That's wonderful. And, and uh, they will know, but in, they, if, if they should be um, conveyed in a different thought than what you had raised them, they're innocent. God loves them. Don't you, don't you waste any time worrying about it. You know, God loves his children, especially children that have problems, that are still trying. He counts that double, okay? And, uh, well, where's that written? I just know our Father. He's a Father of love. He doesn't wake up every morning and say, I wonder how many of them I can zap today. How many can we convert today? Love, charity, at the very root, okay? So don't, don't worry about your children. God loves them. They're in good shape. All right, I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Most of all, though, God loves you for it. Hey, it makes His day when you read the letter of love that He has sent to you and, and you exercise it in your mind and exercise your mind in it makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? It's real simple. Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.